Yeah. Cool. Thank you, everyone. We're back in a couple of minutes or so. One minute or so. Yeah. I'll put uh, yours up full screen so that we can just take in delicious looking. Can I take mask off, Carol? Yeah, Apparently, it takes four hours to get someone COVID. Yeah, that's exactly right. I'm rat negative, and uh, I, our care points, we're, we're acceptable. Um, are we back on? Good to go? Transmitting? Yeah. Morning, everyone. Um, so today, I'm going to pretty much do a crash course in um, snakes, uh, spider bites, and I'm just going to touch quickly on the blue ring doctor pause. Um, what I'll focus on today in the talk is I'm going to specifically stick to um, the Eastern Brown and Sydney Funnel Web just because in 30 minutes there's so much content um, to cover uh, in this. And as you can see on the front, we've uh, got a dangerous drop there um, lining up its prey. Um, so, as I said, I'm going to cover snake spiders, um, the blue ring octopus, late night kebabs will not be covered in this talk, and things that can cause you serious damage. Um, this is the snake and spider white clinical management guidelines, which were done almost nine years ago now. This is the third edition of them. They're still the most current, and that's an excellent document um, for anyone wanting to uh, kind of have a bit of a, a deeper dive into the topic. It doesn't cover specifically the toxins, but it covers the um, clinical syndromes of both um, snakes and spiders um, in New South Wales and gives a very um, sensible algorithm to treat. So highly recommend that for um, any of the UK doctors who are wanting to do a little bit more around the toxinology in New South Wales. Um, a lot of the data from that edition um, was, a, was taken from a project that was in progress at the time and they're still continuing the Australian snake bite project as we go. And this was um, a study done out of the University of Newcastle that went over 10 years that was led by a number of toxicologists, including Jeff Spister, who comes up a lot in tox circles. Um, he's based out in Newcastle and has uh, done a lot around snakes and spiders. But this was a really breakthrough study for... For essentially the 30 years before that, um, a lot of what we did around toxinology with uh, venomous snakes and spiders, a lot of it was still quite low-level data and was what we thought was best practice. Um, and then they actually started to get a proper database of 1,500 bytes over time um, to collate what we thought was, well, at the time, what we thought was best practice and what currently is best practice now. So key highlights of that study, um, looking at that, was that they, they looked at deaths. And as you can see um, from the number of deaths, the majority of the deaths occur with brown snake uh, envenomations, and there are a lot of them tend to be in males and in rural areas. Something else that was um, came out of that study, which was really interesting, was that we looked at the um, VDK, which is the snake venom detection kits, um, and from that study, we kind of realised that what well, we already knew in that they were tricky and fiddly to do. If anyone's ever done one, I've certainly tried to do it on a couple of occasions, and it becomes very tedious, and it's best done by the lab. But the false positive in those kits is um, up to 35% in the study that they did, um, whereas they also had a misdiagnosis rate of somewhere between 5 and 10%. Um, interestingly, looking through that, you can see that out-of-hospital cardiac arrest comes up a lot with brown snake envenomations. There's a number of theories as to why... Um, people die out of hospital with brown snake uh, envenomations and one of them is that when I'll go into a little bit further is not necessarily that they're dying from a myotoxin or a neurotoxin or overwhelming VIC which I'll go into in a second because actually they think there might be a cardiac toxin uh, in the, um, the brown snake venom that triggers a, uh, uh, a malignant arrhythmia that um, causes them to arrest. Interestingly intracranial hemorrhage comes up quite a bit there and unfortunately I've treated a patient who um, who died of a, a tiger snake bite um, and was found to have an intracranial hemorrhage at the time as well. 
So snakes in New South Wales and the Sydney Basin. Um, so in Sydney Basin itself, eastern browns you will see on the fringes, not so much in the urban um, metropolitan areas here. Red belly blacks, um, you'll see them in my local park, so they're even down at the Sydney Park, just down the road from me at Sydney Uni, but they tend to be quite aloof. Death adders um, are rarer still in that they are very much like to keep a low profile. Tiger snakes we don't really see in the Sydney Basin in New South Wales. We see them out west, but they're more into the southern highlands, Victoria and Tasmania. Copperheads, which are related to the um, tiger snake family, tend to be in almost exclusively up in Kosciuszko National Park uh, around the alpine areas. Um, the taipan, we do get coastal taipans, but they tend to be on the north coast. Um, and sea snakes do occur off the coast, but there's never been a bite uh, or a documented envenomation here. Um, in terms of why snake bites occur, it's really very much dependent on the characteristics of the snake as well as the characteristics of the human. So behaviour, the anatomy and the environment um, plays a big part. And, and I'll go into that with the eastern brown. So a lot of snakes, a vast majority of snakes that you encounter really don't want to know us um, and they've gone by the time they've even heard us especially through vibration in the ground however if you do catch them by surprise especially the eastern brown um, it tends to kind of stay in fight or it will strike you it doesn't really give you a warning it will just attack um, the anatomy is important mainly around the fangs so a majority of snakes can't actually penetrate through a thick soled boot um, I was just saying before the presentation started I had an encounter with a copperhead up in Kosciuszko two weeks ago, um, where he actually slid it over my foot, um, but the, the fangs are uh, two mils, so they can't get through a pair of waders, they can't get through a sock, and they can't get through a boot. Um, and then the environment plays a really big part, mainly in brown snakes that they've studied. So it's really interesting with brown snakes, especially where, um, where I grew up, we would encounter brown snakes in the orchards at the back of our property quite a bit. Um, in cooler months and they would usually be hibernating um, and someone actually looked at this at the reptile park and said pretty much under 24 degrees a brown snake is actually quite docile you can approach it but if you if you ag uh, agitate it or upset it it's still going to strike you but you can get much closer however if the temperature goes above 24 degrees um, even from a distance they'll tend to be quite standoffish and aggressive so something to note that in the winter months brown snake bites tend to be less because they tend to be less agitated at the time and most people are able to see the snake and back off and leave it alone. Characteristics of the human, um, so you've obviously got people who aren't educated about snakes being venomous. Um, a lot of misidentification occurs, um, which I'll go into a little bit more, um, trying to impress people picking up the snake. Um, there was a gentleman who actually died on the uh, Alpine Way about three years ago who saw a tiger snake crossing the road, stopped the car and picked it up to show his girlfriend. Um, and he unfortunately died before the time he got to Cooma. Um, and then there's people just unlucky um, having encounters, especially around farming property, lifting up corrugated iron tins. Um, there was one, I remember there was a gentleman who had an eastern brown bite um, he was the postmaster of one of the post offices um, out the back of a place called Wingham and he opened the back where all the mail was sitting um, and the brown snake had got into that. So as he lifted the letters out in the mail sorting room, it struck him on the face several times. Um, and so that's just unlucky. And then, of course, drugs and alcohol um, where people are intoxicated and, and uh, disinhibited. In terms of clinical syndromes for Australian snake bites, this, the New South Wales guideline goes through talking about sudden collapse, um, VIC, which is the most important, neurotoxicity, myotoxicity, and then anticoagulant coagulopathy. Realistically, you can look at it into kind of most snake bites across the world, you can really categorise them into kind of three syndromes, and that's either the venom's a myotoxin, as in it affects your muscles and breaks down your muscles. It's a neurotoxin, so it's going to paralyse you. Um, or it's a hematoxin, so it's going to cause um, a pro-coagulant or an anticoagulant effect. With up the top, sudden collapse and VIC account for most of the deaths in Australia. And the sudden collapse, which is attributed mainly to the eastern brown snake, is that classic story of someone gets bitten by the snake, they have a sudden collapse, they go into an arrhythmia, their syncope, um, and for those who actually survive that initial sudden collapse, they usually have recovery within a couple of minutes and then present to hospital, usually with a headache, vomiting, uh, nausea. VIC, which is venom-induced consumptive coagulopathy, 
um, is is pretty much the most important syndrome that we see, especially in eastern browns and tiger snakes, which account for a majority of the bites. And that's where you actually trigger a pro-coagulation effect within the blood. So you start to get in clot, clotting of the blood, um, but because you're clotting in the blood, you start to consume all of your products, so they start to bleed elsewhere. Neurotoxicity um, is important, but tends to be delayed. Um, I've only seen one case of neurotoxicity, which was in an 11 year old that got bitten by a rough scaled, rough scaled snake a couple of years ago, but she was a late presentation and she was actually in full blown Vic at that time. Um, myotoxicity is another thing that you tend to see around delayed neurotoxicity, um, usually because of paralysis, long lies, um, but there are some snakes that cause um, myotoxins. In terms of anticoagulant coagulopathy, uh, this is almost exclusively seen in black snakes. So you're classically your red-bellied black snake and also in the Northern Territory, your king brown, which is called the mulga snake, um, which actually is actually a member of the black snake family and not related to brown snakes at all. Um, TMA is essentially what's going on at a cellular level where you're getting um, hemolysis of the, of the blood um, and damage to the capillary bed. So if someone does a blood film, you're going to see lots of red cell fragments. Uh, and that's usually what ends up causing you to require um, dialysis in the context of combined myotoxicity and rhabdomyolysis. Systemic symptoms um, of nausea, vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, diaphoresis and headache are really non-specific um, and you see that across a lot of uh, venomous snake bites, uh, especially ones that we don't consider life-threatening or you can just monitor for as well. Um, going through, I'm not going to go through the whole table, but just touching on the brown snake, Vic, which I said is really important, as you see neurotoxicity is around mild, but going right to the far right of that table, about a third of brown snake bites have a collapse. So, uh, and then cardiac arrest is kind of a subtext of a sub uh, point of, of that. Tiger snake groups, Vic is most common, but they also do, um, they can get neurotoxicity. Um, the death adder, which we do see up into the Blue Mountains, and there's been a couple of death adder bites in the last kind of 20 years, but pretty rare because they're an ambush predator that likes to keep to itself. Is, is a clinically differentiated syndrome in the sense that it's going to cause both skeletal and autonomic muscle paralysis. And so that's a descending, rapidly descending flaccid paralysis. Um, and I'll talk briefly about a case towards the end that Retrieval uh, looked after 15 years ago now. Um, and then the Taipan, um, which we thankfully don't see down this far south. So the Taipan that makes, one of the things that makes Taipans particularly nasty is that they cause a neurotoxicity as well as a Vic, um, but they have long fangs and they're generally quite an aggressive um, species of snake. So they've got a nine millimetre fang. Um, and so they penetrate clothing, even if you're working in the cane fields or wherever you are on the north coast, But they, and they tend to be standoffish, so they won't be perturbed or disturbed by you um, coming in their way. Well. They'll just bite you. Eastern brown snake. So I think, touching on that, the eastern brown is the most commonly encountered venomous snake in New South Wales. It accounts for the most deaths in Australia as well. In terms of identification, the way that you can kind of pick, kind of pick a brown snake is they usually have a small head that it's the same size as the neck. You can kind of they see that they have this confluence with the neck. But saying that, um, uh, I'll go into it as I said. But the fangs can go up to four mil. They tend to be about three millimeters. So, so we're still talking very small, um, which is why a lot of the bites don't penetrate, thankfully. Um, and then for a bit of cheek. The way that you're actually meant to fully identify or can only accurately identify a species of snakes is to actually look at the mid-body scales and then the anal scales is what the hepatologist will say is the, is the true way of, of identifying a snake. And uh, I can remember a story of a patient um, in the non-territory who was very unwell with a brown snake bite and the, uh, on the phone the uh, toxicologist actually asked, he goes, did you look at the anal scales? And uh, we kind of like, we're a bit past that, mate. <laughs> um, now, colour is really important. I've actually borrowed this off um, Lee, who took this from the guys at the Reptile Park up at um, Summersby. And these are all eastern browns. And so the fact that it's a brown snake is a bit of a misnomer in the sense that these are, I think it was like a five kilometre radius these snakes are from. So they're from the same area in the same part of the state and they're all the different colour. And certainly... Um, where I'm from up the coast, a majority, a vast majority of our brown snakes were that bottom left, almost that olive colour. 
Um, so we're always told, don't think it's just a tree snake. It could well and truly be an eastern brown. And they, they would even be almost a, like a real green um, about them. But you can see that they, they change quite a bit um, and they vary in, in their colour. Things that make brown snake bites common too from a behavioural point of view is that they're diurnal feeders. So they feed in the day. They have a diverse habitat. So they'll go from anything from urban grasslands to rainforest. They thrive in farms. They tend to eat frogs, reptiles and reptile eggs. Um, and the thing is that they're nervous and easily agitated when surprised. So they do two things. Um, they'll raise their head and then they'll coil into an S shape. Um, and I don't know, if, has anyone in the audience ever come across a uh, brown snake and had an incident? No, no. So like every now and then, so um, it's usually the dogs on the properties that get bitten all the time. Um, they go around and sniff the snake. And, and I've unfortunately witnessed uh, the neighbor's dog get bitten by one of these. And they do, they, they actually coil up and they just strike. Um, we talked briefly about the, the temperature characteristics before. Um, dry bites are highly variable with brown snakes, thankfully. So they will often strike and not envenomate. Um, it's really hard to differentiate a dry bite from an envenomation in brown snakes because a vast majority of brown snake bites um, do actually present asymptomatic. They don't hurt. People look at, generally feel a scratch um, or a mild bite and they don't actually know that they've been envenomated and then the syndrome starts to develop. Um, it's a highly potent toxin, so the lethal dose, LD50 of the Eastern Brown, as you can see, it can kill 200,000 mice in one bite. Um, so signs and symptoms, majority are minimal. Um, we talked about that earlier, cardiovascular collapse or a syncope, um, headache, nausea, vomiting, painless bleeding. And the two cases I can think of, actually the two recent cases that I've dealt with in the last few years, the last case I dealt with was a man up in Nimbin, if everyone knows that place. Um, he went out to go to the toilet in the early hours of the morning and got back in bed and he said to his wife, he said, honey, uh, a mouse bit me. She said, what do you mean a mouse bit? And he goes, well, I assume as a mice, you know, we have mice on the thing, but I, I was on the porch and I felt a little uh, between my feet and, yeah, a mouse bit me. And she goes, honey, mice don't bite in Australia. I'd like, turn on the light and, and he's like, oh, I feel okay. And then he started to get a headache and he started to be nauseated. But he came to us um, at about 6 a.m. in the morning and looked completely normal. We had a pressure mobilisation bandage on him um, and it wasn't until we actually did the bloods that we found out that he was in full blind Vic and had had quite a severe envenomation from uh, a brown snake. Um, in terms of the painless bleeding as well, um, that that's actually quite common because you're already starting to um, get uh, anticoagulation of the blood. Um, and a colleague of mine, uh, when I was in Broken Hill, actually, between Cobar, I had a patient, a woman come in who went to the toilet on the side of the road, didn't know she had been bitten, um, and actually thought she was menstruating in the car because she was sitting in a pool of her blood. And she looked down and she was bleeding into the car seat. And they were like, what, what's going on? And when she took off her pants, she had a bite mark on her bottom and she was just bleeding consistently oozing out of the bite mark, um, which also turned out to be a brown snake. And she was she felt absolutely fine, um, but she was starting to develop signs of Vic as well. Um, so in terms of early management, this is just broadly with snake bites in general. So pressure mobilization bandage is the key uh, and then splinting. So it, Traditionally, we'd say that all a, a majority of your snake venom travels through the lymphatic system and then a small amount does travel through the blood. And I think previously it was it used to be said that it was purely lymphatic spread, but it is actually, it travels through the blood in some, uh, some of it will go through the venous drainage system. So, but the PIB does save lives, it is effective. Um, so pressure mobilisation bandaging and then also splinting. So making sure that the patient doesn't move that affected limb Early large bore drill access is really handy if you're going to find out that you're treating an envenomation. And the reason is that one of your lines is going to be for your antivenom, and the second line is going to be as a sampling line, but also because of the quite large rate of anaphylaxis, you're not going to give IM injections once you've got demonstrated signs of VIC um, because you get a compartment syndrome risk. And certainly I have seen it where um, we had an anaphylaxis from snake bite, uh, antivenom, we gave the IM injection, and then they just blew out this huge hematoma which we then had to refer to the plastics team. Um, you've got examination. We talk about workup and then antivenom. So in terms of examination, you're going to be looking for neurological signs, which, as I said, tend to be rare, uh, especially in Eastern Browns, um, but ophthalmoplegia, ptosis, bulbal weakness, evidence of bleeding, 
um, is going to be something that's going to be more prevalent. Uh, and then examination of the bite site, looking for fang marks. And sometimes I find it incredibly hard to even see them. If, even when the patient's pointing to it, you're kind of looking for that bipunctum of the, the bite site. But as I said, we're dealing with two to three mil fangs and some of these people who have usually a lower limb bite and they're usually tradies or someone who works outside. So they've got cut, cut scratches, marks all over them. So they kind of point at a couple sites and it can be quite tricky. Um, PIBs... Just to quickly talk about them, um, they say you should start below and then go across the site and come back down. There's a slightly different um, mantra around funnel web bites, but um, we're talking snakes at the moment. So it's it's essentially you're going for the whole limb and all the way down um, in and making sure you, you try and splint that limb afterwards as well. A guy called Bart Curry, who's a bit, a bit of a famous guy up in the Territory, along with Jeff and a medical student who I don't know what Elizabeth's doing now. They went and actually looked at pressure mobilisation bandages not using the proper PIBs and just looked at when you did it with a crepe or another type of bandage. Um, it was a quite interesting study. They, they got the ambulance service um, to put these on and then they got the ambulances to drive around Darwin to simulate them taking a patient from the countryside to the hospital and they found that essentially crepe bandages were inadequate. Um, and that a vast majority of those bandages um, were not offering pressure mobilisation by the time they arrived in the hospital and the patients move and they slip. Investigations. So, as I said, the FBC plus the blood film, which is going to show some hemolysis in that VIC. Um, UEC CMP CKs are going to show um, your myotoxicity. INID, dimethyprinogen and APTT. Now, usually... When you see these envenomations, nothing's happening by halves. They may be clinically asymptomatic, but you'll see the D-dimer will almost certainly be above 10 already, even within 30 minutes, and then your fibrinogen will rapidly go down. And the last one I treated, which was that man who got bitten in Nimbin, his D-dimer was greater than, 10, tw uh, greater than 20 and he had an undetectable fibrinogen, but he was actually asymptomatic at that time. He felt absolutely fine. Whole blood clotting time is not really done anymore. It's kind of tedious, so... Some places will advocate you just have a whole blood clotting time and start the stopwatch. Um, and if it's delayed, well, then you've got um, signs of VIC. And then the SVDK, um, which you can use either urine and the bite site. And it, look, they're really tedious. They should be sent to the lab. If you're really unsure, you can use them. But has anyone ever had to use one? Have you used an S? Did you use in Darwin? Uh, no, Gosford. In Gosford. What about you? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, and that's the thing. And, and you know, there's... Um, the best SVDK story I heard was from two Kiwi doctors working in Port Macquarie where a guy came in with a snake bite. They did the SVDK and he came up positive for both tiger and brown snake and they were really panicked. They're like, what do we do? What do we do? And one of the nurses came in. They said, we've got the snake in the bag. So the nurse looked in the bag and it was a blue tongue lizard. Um, <laughs> So he was, yeah, they were freaking out. They're like, ah, oh, and the guy was fine. He went home. Um, group and screen is important because you might need to give blood products. Layers with tox. Um, and this is kind of a point. The point of care INR and coags at the smaller sites using the EPOC machine are not really accurate and you can't use them. So they need to be in a proper hospital. Um, so the treatment decision comes to knowledge of snakes in the area the clinical syndrome defined. Um, we talked about SVDK liaison with toxicologists and lo local protocols. So, for example, Lismore's local protocol, they don't do polyvalent. They just do one vial of brown, one vial of um, tiger. And that's if, if they don't know um, what's happening and that's just what they go ahead with. Um, that's straight from e what ETG has, but also this policy has. And it just talks about, well, if you haven't got an envenomation, when to look at them, how long do you leave the PIB on for? Essentially, you should leave the PIB on, do your bloods. If there's no sign clinically of envenomation and biochemically of envenomation, you, should, you can take it down, but you need to observe them up to 24 hours in some cases, depending on what the snakes are in the region, and you can just repeat bloods with serial examination. Um, absolute and relative indications to antivenom, and you've got abnormal INR with clinical syndromes, um, evidence of paralysis. So one of those caveats is that the death adder is not going to show biochemical derangement. You're just going to be treating that on spec, given that you're going to see a, a descending paralysis. Um, I was thinking about retrieval specifics if we're out west and we're dealing with snake bites. Pretty much any level one emergency department carries monovalent and polyvalent venom. Uh, anti-venom um, and so even your tiny little places will always have something in the fridge so if we need to get anti-venom brought to the aircraft or ambulance 
Um, even some of the multi-purpose centres will have them. Um, so it's pretty widely, pretty um, widely available. And it's, I think it'd be a case like if we're in a pre-hospital or far west setting where we're not going to have access to biochemical treatment, and, but we strongly suspect an envenomation, you just start the treatment. Um, they should go to a centre with antivenom um, with ICU facilities. They generally get monitored in the ICU. One vial is the treatment. Um, it doesn't stop, uh, it doesn't reverse the VIC, um, but can prevent intubation. It can reduce renal complications and myotoxicity. Um, and that's certainly um, the case with brown snakes. Now, there's quite a number of complications of antivenom because it's made with uh, horse blood. Um, there's a 5% incidence of anaphylaxis. And the way that you treat that anaphylaxis, just going through that, is that you don't give IM injections because you're going to talk about that compartment syndrome. You just act, you just start an adrenaline infusion and you can do that peripherally. Cutaneous reaction is quite common and then you have a 33% delayed onset of serum sickness. Um, running through complications, it's you know major bleeding. Well, you're going to give blood products. If you've got microangiopathy and they need to be dialyzed, you dialyze them. Um, if they're showing signs of neuromuscular weakness, you're going to um, you're going to intubate them. You're going to use an adrenaline infusion for anaphylaxis, and you can have outpatient prednisone for serum sickness. Um, this was a case that I was involved with um, a couple of years ago. This is an 11 year old. She got bitten by a rough scaled snake, which is a tiger snake family. Um, she actually got bitten putting the chickens away in her home up in um, Mullumbimby. Uh, and told her mum that she'd been bitten by a snake and she had a bit of a history of being an 11-year-old and telling stories. So her mum didn't believe her and put it to bed. Um, and she came in in complete hemodynamic collapse um, and was intubated on arrival the next um, morning at Lismore. Uh, and she had all the complications. So she was actually in, in complete VIC, um, but she was profoundly uh, neuromuscular weak and had also developed quite bad rhabdomyolysis Purely, probably from long lie, um, but she ended up in um, Brisbane and she was on a ventilator with a trackie for 19 days and had a 53-day um, hospital admission. Um, but, yeah, she couldn't even open her eyes, but I think that was because she was actually peri-arrest peri as opposed to profoundly, um, profoundly in venom. Um, there's a little bit of one vial controversy floating around. I don't know if anyone's read that in the news about cases in Victoria and um, South Australia, the, uh, sorry, and Tasmania, where large tiger snake envenomations have been treated with one vial and the patient's actually gone on to die. So it's, it's almost like the Brisbane line. These coast guys think one vial's enough, and I actually spoke to a, a text toxicologist about this yesterday, and he said, I still advocate one vial, um, whereas if you go pretty much to South Australia and across to Perth, they would say that treat with one vial, but be ready to give multiple vials, especially in tiger snake envenomation. So at the moment, I would say in New South Wales, we're still going to do one vial, and we're going to talk to tox um, if you would think that you needed more. How am I going for time, Laura? Uh, yeah, a couple more minutes. Okay. Um, this was one that was retrieval from 2006, which was a man that grabbed a, um, a blue tongue lizard that actually was a death adder, um, but he was highly intoxicated and was bitten five times on the hand um, and arrested. And I was actually I was talking to um, Shane about this, who had just started as a consultant, and it was a UK uh, registrar who had arrived, and I think it was two weeks after they'd arrived in Australia, getting called to a cardiac arrest for a death adder bite. Um, a bit of a difference, but <laughs> you can see. Um, snake bites, as I said, sea snakes don't really occur in Australia, um, and they generally call on the fishing trawlers when they bring the long lines in or the nets. The snakes are caught in the net and they bite, um, and they're almost they're almost certainly fatal, highly toxic. You're well and truly away from any medical facility, so they've got a pretty high um, death rate. Sydney funnel web spiders... I'm going to quickly run through. So funnel web species, there's actually 40 species of funnel web in Australia. We talk about the Sydney funnel web, which is all the way from Hornsby down to Wollongong, oh, sorry, all the way from Newcastle down to Wollongong. That's the kind of classic Sydney funnel web. Um, it lives in your garden. Uh, it's about five centimetres long. Um, it prefers a moist um, environment. Something you notice um, in your garden, if you've ever seen the funnels, um, you see a lot of funnel webs that aren't actually funnel web spiders, and this is nice and clean and tidy. That tends to be a trapdoor spider, but the kind of pathognomonic 
dwelling of the funnel webbers, it's got these long spindly silk fibres on the burrow, so you can be sure that that's going to be um, a funnel web uh, as burrow. In terms of bites, we see this quite a bit. I mean, Carl would see it at beaches as well, all the way up to Hornsby in Newcastle. Gosford has the highest bites in Australia. Um, is that you get a lot of dry bites um, with the funnel web. Um, and one of the things that you tend to know was if, it, if they have envenomated is that the bites actually, an envenomation bite really hurts because it's got um, deep fangs and the pH of the venom is, is acidic. So it's quite, it's like being bitten by a bull and if you experience that, it's that really deep formic acid kind of pain. Um, so they come in in a lot of pain. Um, lots of differentials around Sydney. There's trapdoor spiders, there's mouse spiders, um, there's a, a thing up near Gyra, um, and then there's the black house spider. Um, going through this, so the guy on the left is actually uh, a, a much more, a really common spider, um, which is just a trapdoor spider. And the way that you can tell that he's not a funnel web, basically, is that he's not dressed in uh, an Amani black suit. He's uh, in, a, in a bit of an old casual tweed, and he's got little boxing gloves on. Um, that's the way that they kind of say right at the front on the on the front too. Um, that's a mouse spider that looks like it belongs in Spider-Man, the one on the top. And then the two brown guys are actually the Hydronike species, which are the tree-dwelling funnel webs that you see up the north coast. So they're not actually funnel web spiders that live in the ground. They actually live in the trees, and they come down during summer after rain. The males will go looking for a female burrow. Um, and then the other one on the right is also a mouse spider, um, which you can see, you know, looks... They all look kind of similar in some regards. Signs and symptoms of the funnel web bite. Um, so you, you're dealing with robusta toxin, which is going to depolarise your acetylcholine receptors, so you're going to get a mixed picture, but you get a cholinergic and adrenergic access. Um, patients are in pain. They look terrible. They tend to be sweaty, diaphoretic. They've got paraseizures. But um, in terms of real envenomations, the kind of key things is you start to see muscle fasciculations, especially around the tongue. They get muscle spasms and then they quickly develop pulmonary edema um, and they're in a lot of pain because the bites hurt. Um, in New South Wales, we have the big black spider protocol. If it's big, it's black and it's bit you, you need to put a PIB on, observe for four hours um, and then you can take it out, down after two hours. There's no sign of animation. They do dry bite a lot, funnel webs, thankfully. Um, and then in venomation dose, so differentiating from a uh, snake bite is that you will give two vials and that it is dose dependent, especially if you've been bitten up in the northern rivers or north of Newcastle and it's not a Sydney funnel web, you'll be looking to give um, more vials because the species, we make it for Sydney funnel web, but the hydronike um, or the tree dwelling funnel web species is not quite the same venom. So they usually need a little bit more, but it's still effective against that. Um, ventilation and peat, atropine, tetanus, inotropic support and strong analgesia. So. Um, certainly the ones that I, I've only been involved with one of these um, recently and they ended up getting intubated but they were fine the next day and they were extubated, taken away from the kids hospital the next day um, and the family were upset that the child, um, the daycare were the ones that copped most of the, um, most of the scorn of the parents. Um, milking and antivenom, I know we're running out of time, but it, really interesting. No one's actually died since um, a guy called Sean Sutherland introduced antivenine back in 1981, and that was a really, really hard thing to do. Snakes were much easier. They were using, um, they were using horses' blood to make the antivenom, and they couldn't stabilise the um, robusta toxin using horses' blood, and they kind of faffed around and fiddled and fiddled and fiddled, and eventually made the um, funnel web antivenom using rabbits. Um, and I was going to play a quick video from the Reptile Park. You got, how long we got? Am I, am I way over? No, 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 just okay. keep going. Okay. Um, okay. Ooh, will that play sound, Carol? Uh, it's off my computer, so... Whether it's sending the audio through. The best way is to choose to send the audio to the, mic, to the actual... Let's go to here. One second on the slide. Spiders do come to us oh, yeah. via public donation. Now, in order to actually catch the spider, 
what you will need is a large jar like this one here. Now today we've got this female Sydney funnelweb spider reared up in front of me. If the spider is stationary, not moving, what you can do is pop your jar next to the spider, keeping your fingers at a safe distance of course, and then you can use a large spoon or maybe even a 30 centimetre ruler to gently encourage the spider into the jar, just like that, very easy. Now, if your funnel web spider is moving, it's a bit of a different story. What you wanna do is take your jar and very simply pop it in front of the spider like that, and it will walk straight into it. Now that you've safely captured your funnel web spider and it's contained in the jar, what you wanna do is take a little bit of damp soil from the garden, or perhaps even a damp ball of cotton wool, and pop it in the jar with the spider. This will provide your funnel web with a little bit of moisture inside the jar and will keep it nice and happy and healthy until you can either get it to one of our drop-off points. We have them as far south as the Sutherland Shire and as far north as Newcastle. Or, of course, you can drop your spider directly to us here at the Australian Reptile Park. Once your spider's in the jar with a bit of moisture, of course, pop the lid on to finish off. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope this helped you out a bit. And, of course, if you are catching a... <laughs> to get a spider. It's, um, it's quite a... It's... So if you if you do work at Hornsby or um or Gosford, you will see that there's people who regularly drop them in. Um, and so Hornsby has actually its own cupboard where we drop the spiders in. Um, if you've worked up there, and they they need about 120 spiders to make one vial of anti venom. So that's why they really encourage the public to bring them in. And guys, bring like it's. It's pretty crazy. Like, you see people just come in with milk. They usually put them in milk bottles or, like, at the bottom, and they just come in. They're like, oh, hey, I've got a funnel web. And you're like, oh, yeah, yeah. And then the nurse just, the triage nurse just pops in this little thing. We have pre-made cotton balls of, um, uh, of saline, and then you just pop it in. You're like, oh, it's good. That's good. Okay, all done. Um, oh, hold on. I've lost my presentation. Oh, yeah. Where am I? Poison's critter. There we go. Yep. Um... Oh, and then I just briefly wanted to talk about Blue Ring Doctopus. Um, did everyone see the video that I sent in the group chat? I put it in Retrieval 19. That was actually um, courtesy of George Davison. He told me I had to cite him. That was just him down at Narrabeen last year, uh, taking his dog for a walk. So if you see the video, it's, I've got it on the thing. Um, and he just saw one in the rock pool um, floating along there. So they're actually... I don't know if you've come across them. They're actually really small. They're, you always think they're quite large, but they fit in the palm of your hand. They only go that beautiful blue colour when they've been threatened. Um, and they're pretty prolific all the way up the coast, up into Southeast Asia and even into America. The toxin that's from them is a thing called tetrodotoxin, um, which blocks sodium channels. And what's interesting is it's the same toxin that you find in cone, um, cone snails and a lot of your marine toxins that cause paralysis. And... The Blue Ring Doctopus doesn't actually make the toxin. It's just found in its body and beak along with the cone snails, and it's due to what they call symbiotic bacteria um, that produce the toxin. So it's in a number of these marine animals. So it's actually circulating. So it's, it's, just, it's been an evolutionary um, progress. It's a painless bite. Um, it does respond to pressure immobilisation bandaging. Um, there isn't there isn't an antivenine manufactured for it, so it's about early ventilation and mechanical support um, for that. And I don't think Sydney's actually had to do treat one for 20 years. I don't think there's been a bite. Um, the only marine envenomation that I've treated, apart from box jellyfish, is a cone snail, which is a similar toxin, and they had bulbar palsy and, and required intervention uh, intubation at that point. Um, I was going to show another video, but I think we're a bit short on time. <laughs> You got a video? Okay. Something that's quite interesting that I didn't um, go into with pressure immobilisation bandaging is that with um, pressure immobilisation bandaging, especially uh, talking about funnel web bites, is that when they were looking at um, pressure immobilisation bandaging for spider bites and snake bites, that they noticed that the robusta toxin of funnel webs was actually pressure labile. So by giving a decent amount of pressure over the bite site was actually causing some of the robusta toxin to break down, which is a little bit different to the snakes. The snakes are just trying to stop it getting there. But actually, when they talk about um, immobilising below and above the bite site with a, with a spider bite, they often say put a bit of pressure on the actual bite site itself, go distal, then come proximal um, over the site as well.
Um, and they've, they, they demonstrated that on spider monkeys of all animals, that they actually managed to keep spider monkeys alive by just pure pressure mobilisation bandaging um, of the limbs. If you're a woman who owns a business, then you need a virtual assistant, and not just any virtual assistant. She thought it was just a cute little baby octopus she was handling, and she put a video of it on TikTok. And only then did she find out that that cute critter is one of the most deadly animals in the ocean. One bite, and you could be dead in minutes. Wow. Oh, how adorable. What a cute little guy. I saw it in the water, and I thought, you know, my initial reaction was to just pick it up. And then you find out that little tiny creature could have killed you and over 20 people. Talk about a shocker. Kaylin Phillips had no idea the creature from the sea she and her friends were passing around on a beach in Bali is one of the deadliest on the planet. Let's I, eat it. No, don't say that. I posted the picture on my Instagram story and I got a couple comments like, hey, do you know that this is the blue ring octopus? Right over my head. No idea. She found out it was, in fact, a blue ringed octopus with enough poison to kill more than 20 people. 20 you people. It's been radicalized. <laughs> going on a spree. <laughs> Played a lot of video games, you know, got in the wrong crowd at school. She's very lucky that nothing happened to her. These tiny little goals. Um, so we, last year, I saw a child in the ED and the mum rushed the kid in and it, it was very fortunate. So she picked up a shell on the beach at Balmoral um, and put the shell in her one-piece swimsuit because she was collecting shells. And then she pulled the shell out and the blue ring octopus had been hiding in the shell. And so she had sit it, sat it against her tummy the whole time and then came out. And because the bite on the beak of them is so small and often painless, we ended up sitting her in the ED for six hours and watching her and she was fine. But it was very lucky because she actually held the blue ring octopus against her in her cosy in the shell for a good 10 minutes. And it was when she actually got out of the water, she came out um, and brought it out. So um, that was a, a fortunate outcome. Look, guys, I've kind of raced through a lot of that. Are there any questions? Um, just one question. Question? To your yep. Snake venom. Yeah. Because um, obviously I've never given anyone a snake venom, but I've heard some stories. And the idea of if you have anaphylaxis, you often remove the trigger. But I understand, obviously, you need to give the whole dose. Yes, so, that, that's true. So you, what, what are your options? And then you've got the people that come back. <laughs> time and time again, I suppose more rural, having been yeah. bitten before and having had venom before. And what I just wonder what people's experiences were that. How often now when you're giving the venom, do you draw up um, your vasopressors or what do you have around? Um, and just see yeah, a bit about that. I think if you've given polyvalent, you should definitely have some adrenaline ready to give because it is much more common. Um, but if people have had it before, that's a bigger risk factor, particularly snake handlers. Snake handlers sometimes will refuse anti-venom because they've been treated so many times that they just don't feel it's risk, worth the risk. Um, that's been my experience. But, yeah, it is high enough that you should be prepared for anaphylaxis. The the treatment for anaphylaxis of a true envenomation is to slow the infusion of antivenom down and continue it, but not stop it. Um, well, any other questions? We had one from the, um, from the WhatsApp group was, um, what about um, like TEG? Uh, as a means of measuring people's coags, is there any information about that? that actually, about? It's, it's interesting. I actually asked Lindsay Murray about this yesterday, yeah. um, and it, no one's done a tag on it. Oh, okay. um, that in work, terms though. of things, so I mean, you're gonna, uh, you're obviously, you're gonna see oh, it's gonna, it's, it's gonna tailor, yeah, it's gonna tailor down, anyway. your um, factor replacement. Um, but the only snake bite I've ever given or considered blood products in was a woman who was a delayed presentation from a tiger bite um, in out west of Coffs Harbour, and she but she was anticoagulated on dibigatran, um, and so she was in real trouble, and unfortunately she died. Um, she was just she was just bleeding from everywhere, and actually when. The um, ICPs intubated her pre-hospital. She actually, they lost the airway because of so much, even just gentle mm -hmm. soiling of the airway. She just bled out. Um, and it was, it was just, it was awful. Yeah. Uh, nice. And then there was another. Someone asked, um, do we see enough envenomations here to to carry uh, anti venom? We a long, long time ago in the history of retrieval, actually had anti venoms on bases, but we, it never got used and just went uh, out of date and got thrown out. So we don't use it anymore. 
Um, we don't carry it because we know that where we can get it and there's antivenom at all yeah. the hospitals and the ACC have a list of all the hospitals and how much antivenom they have, so um, that's what we do. Um, it's just not worthwhile having very expensive antivenom sitting in a fridge that goes out, out of date and never gets used. Um, final quick point is just the, the one vial um, uh, theory is quite interesting, one vial controversy. Um, Isbister did a study where he measured the um, the, the amount of uh, venom left over after giving a vial of antivenom in hundreds of patients, and there's no no venom left from a single vial. There's way way more uh, antivenom in a single vial than any snake can give you a bottle, and that for that reason recommends a single vial. The problem was that in particularly the distant past, people would see a, a particular tiger or brown snake. And they would measure the co coags, and the coags would be terrible. They'd give antivenom, and the coags would still be terrible. Yeah, but see, the problem with that is that the antivenom just mops up the venom. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't fix your coags because they've already been used up. So you actually have to replace their their effort. You have to give them FFP off and uh, and or cryo to fix their coags. And if you don't do that, then they continue to remain anticoagulated, and no amount of antivenom will fix that. So that was kind of maybe a misunderstanding of the the purposes of antivenom, but. It's very rare to get any to need to give people anti venom um, in Australia now, and just because people generally well, well what up? The only people I ever see is people who tried to kill the snake with a shovel whilst drunk. That's pretty much. It's it. usually barefoot too, and a few beers. Yeah, yep. it's massively intoxicated. Yep. Try and kill the snake, and the snake wins. Any other questions? Um. Cool. Well, thank you very much. That's a great summary, and we'll record that and put it up on the website. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, guys. Good job. <laughs> 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 okay, we need clear